You're listening to episode 69 of The Secular Buddhist. Welcome to The Secular Buddhist. I'm Ted Meissner. The Secular Buddhist is the podcast and website for modern, secular application of early Buddhist thought. The podcast has interviews and roundtable discussions pertaining to engaged Buddhist training and practice, and the companion website has show notes for each episode, along with resource materials on Buddhism, critical thinking, science, secularism, and skeptical thought. Though the podcast focuses on core practice from a secular viewpoint, more traditional teachings are welcome and openly discussed. Dr. Roland Griffiths speaks with us about his work studying psilocybin's intersection with meditation. Many of our Buddhist centers here in the United States got their start and found practitioners in the psychedelic 60s. Literally, the culture of the time had an exploration of pharmacologicals, especially those which could produce altered perceptions of reality. Some have said these experiences led them to meditation, as it opened their minds, no joke intended, to possibilities such altered states suggested. Not all studies were scientific or particularly helpful. In a backlash from the Timothy Leary drug culture, much of the valid scientific work was shut down. It is only recently that some scientists are taking up this particular area of study again. Today's interview is particularly well-timed, as only this week an article about these studies was released to the press. That article is linked on the episode page for this interview on the website. Dr. Roland Griffiths is a professor of behavioral biology, Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, and professor of neuroscience Department of Neuroscience at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He has been given the Solvay Award for Outstanding Basic Psychopharmacological Research on Effective Disorders from the American Psychological Association and the Brady Schuster Award for Outstanding Behavioral Science Research in Psychopharmacology and Substance Abuse. So sit back, relax, and have a nice iced tea. And I'm speaking with Dr. Roland Griffiths. Roland, thank you so much for being here. Pleasure to be with you, Ted. Now, I wanted to start with uh, part of our conversation that we are just having before starting the recording is about your work with substances and their effects on the mind. But let's start with your background, what your education is, how you first encountered meditation, and the study of the mind. Well, let me back up even a little further than that to, uh, in terms of the question about how I got into meditation and tell you just a little bit about my, uh, initial upbringing. So I, I grew up in San Francisco Bay Area and, um, and my religious background was, uh, Episcopal and United Church of Christ, but it, it really had no, uh, no sincere meaning to me. In fact, I flunked out of confirmation class and, <laughs> and didn't look back. And it really just attendance is about it for that one. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. It was a very low threshold and I flunked, yeah. But that was a gauge of my, <laughs> my, uh, disinterest. And, um, and then I, I went on, uh, to Occidental College and, uh, and to your hometown, University of Minnesota, Minneapolis, where I did my um, a PhD in psychopharmacology, cross-disciplinary pharmacology and psychology. But while at Minnesota, um, uh, I came upon a professor there, Aria, who was teaching meditation. Um, and, uh, and in spite of the fact that I was taking a lot of, uh, physiology and neuroscience and pharmacology, there was something that really 
was attractive to me about the idea behind meditation, that it just made sense from a, a scientific worldview that, that people could have possibly explored systematically the nature of mind and thought and, and, and uh, inner perceptual phenomena. And I was willing to excuse the, uh, what seemed to me at the time, uh, a very naive, uh, physiology that was described in the chakra systems and the nadis and what, and what have you. So I was really curious in, in meditation, but as it turned out, um, I, uh, I, I just didn't take him. Three minutes seemed like three hours. It was <laughs> and no one listening to this podcast has ever had that experience in meditation. <laughs> <laughs> it was painful. And, and so in spite of the fact that I was sympathetic to it, I simply dropped it, went on with my graduate studies and, um, and actually came directly out to Johns Hopkins, where I remain and am presently a professor in the departments of psychiatry and neuroscience. So I came out here in 1972 and have been doing uh, psychopharmacology research in animals and humans ever since. And, and this research is focused in on primarily mood-altering drugs, very often drugs of abuse, characterizing the subjective effects, the behavioral effects, and the physiological effects with special emphasis on abuse liability differences between compounds. So then to fast forward about uh, 15 years ago, I had a friend here in Baltimore who was involved with a Siddha Yoga meditation group in Baltimore, became intrigued by her descriptions of her retreat experiences and her unfolding uh, interest in meditation and spirituality. And I uh, tried again and uh, went to um, a program at the City Yoga Meditation Center. And this time, something clicked. And I, and I don't know why. I don't know if it was developmental on my part or the instruction set or, you know, what have you. But it uh, opened up this incredible window for me uh, into a, a sense of, of uh, awe and wonder about uh, inner life and the nature of mind and um, elements of, of spirituality that were deeply moving to me and got me reading all kinds of things on comparative religions and uh, comparative meditation traditions because partly I wanted to figure out what <laughs> what the hell happened to me <laughs> <laughs> and 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 did I need to buy hook line and sinker what I was being told from this one tradition or was there more generality to this and so it got me very curious about the nature of those kinds of questions and and uh, in the course of that it also um, altered my my worldview in that it uh, it really reshifted this core core sense of uh, of self uh, uh, that I had I guess for most of my life um, defined myself on the basis of that little inner voice that told me to do things and told me what it thought <laughs> and uh, that's who who I thought I was. You were being led by the homunculus in your head. <laughs> yeah, I was. I was. <laughs> and, you know, and one of the, you know, uh, I, I hesitate to use the word uh, sad, but in fact, I very much defined myself uh, with material accomplishments. And, uh, and in this case, you know, my research career was important to me. My family was important to me. I was very focused on that, but, uh, in a sense, after getting involved with med meditation, there was a much bigger story to <laughs> that was of interest to me. And, um, and I started wondering actually what, what I was doing in my work in psychopharmacology, what was, what was so compelling about, you know, yet another set of studies investigating abuse liability of compounds, sedatives or stimulants or, or what have you. Uh, and, um, and, uh, so there was a, there was a little period of time where I was, I was, uh, 
I had my feet in two worlds. One was I was exploring meditation traditions and spirituality, and one I was continuing to be in the world as I had um, as I had been accustomed to uh, living in it. And uh, and um, and then I, uh, by a number of coincidences, uh, got reintroduced to this. The whole idea in the literature from the 1960s that some of these classic hallucinogen compounds can occasion experiences that look very similar to spiritual experiences, mystical experiences, if you will. And so, so that idea was, uh, uh, immediately intriguing to me because it seemed to me that it would be an excuse to go in and start reading the uh, comparative uh, about comparative religions to read about what people in the psychology of religion had been doing in this area, and, it, and that was a literature that was, you know, totally unknown to me, and see if we could mount a study to examine some of the effects of a classic hallucinogen. So let me now just describe what the classic hallucinogens are uh, for for your audience. So but mainly for me, with no experience, please. <laughs> so the classic hallucinogens um, are a, a set of compounds uh, that uh, primarily bind serotonin 5-HT2A uh, uh, receptors. That's their primary mode of action, although different compounds have, uh, have activity at other receptor sites. And... Uh, and the prototypes of that class are, are drugs like LSD, which is, uh, as you know, a synthetic uh, compound. But there are a number of compounds like psilocybin from the hallucinogenic uh, psilocybin mushroom and mescaline from the peyote cactus and DMT from ayahuasca, which is a plant admixture that's used in South America. And, and all three of those, um, psilocybin, uh, mescaline, and, uh, and DMT are used sacramentally within some cultures for religious or spiritual purposes. So there's actually a, a long tradition of thousands of years that go back, and that's been probably best documented with psilocybin. Uh, that go back that um, shows that these drugs have been used for long periods within some cultures in very structured manner for divinatory or spiritual purpose. Um, so, so that fits with this the story that was told in the 1960s when these drugs came under study for a period of uh, just over a decade or two. Uh, uh, about the possibility that they could occasion experiences that might have uh, spiritual meaning. 